Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspiring show coming right up with special guest, Sarah Byrne Rickman. And she's here today to share with us her new book, Nancy Love, Wasp Pilot. Now, Sarah has written nine books about the Wasp of World War II. A journalist first, Sarah began her career at the Detroit News and concluded it as the editor at the Centerville Bellbrook Times in Ohio. A graduate from Vanderbilt University, she majored in English and in 1996 earned her master's degree in creative writing from Antioch University Midwest. She earned her sport pilot license in 2011 and has been flying ever since. So let's welcome to the show, Sarah Byrne Rickman. Thank you, Marianne. I appreciate it. You know, what an honor it is to have you here and to talk about this. My goodness, what great history. I think a lot of us never even knew, you know, what was going on with the women pilots back in the day. That's right. Many people knew nothing about them. And I honestly did not hear about them myself until 1986. Oh, wow. So, and, and I got it earlier than a lot of people. It was it was the best kept secret of World War II. It must have been because I, I think everyone's just kind of shocked going, how could we have not known this, you know? Right, right. So what when, when you found out about this information, what has been the inspiration that has led you to you know write the books you've been writing? Because this isn't your first book. You've written many books on these topics. Actually, Nancy's is number nine. Wow. So what was it that really inspired you? Can you take a little bit of a long answer then? Uh, we can take long answers. Don't worry about that. <laughs> uh, all right. As you know, uh, the Nancy Love book and its immediate predecessor, B.J. Erickson, Wasp Pilot, are written aimed at the young adult audience. And I say young adult. The women I'm after are our young girls today, our young women of today roughly age 10 on up. That's who I'm aiming at. And I'll tell you why. I read about Amelia Earhart at age 13. And that reading impacted my life. I had no clue back then how much it would. I was so taken by her story. Uh, Apparently, I had honestly not heard of her at that point. Maybe I had, but I didn't know much. And I read that story and I fell in love with the idea of women flying airplanes. And of course, she had nothing to do with World War II. This was prior to that. So I kind of had to put that on hold uh, for a a number of years. But I always in the back of my mind, I thought, someday I'm going to learn to fly. And really, it took me until I had a lot of age on me before I finally got there. But... In the interim, my interest in Amelia was renewed, rekindled, when I met some women in uh, Centerville, Ohio, which is a a, a suburb of Dayton, where I used to live, and uh, they were opening a new museum, fledgling museum, the International Women's Air and Space Museum. And these were women pilots. Uh, Most of them were 99s, uh, not... And if you don't know what 99s were, I'll explain it in a minute. Uh, But they they were women pilots, uh, and they were trying to preserve the history of women pilots. Basically, Amelia was was the focal point because everyone knows her. But there were many women before her who were very prominent flyers, and this museum was, was talking about them. And they, of course, followed after uh, after Amelia disappeared, within four or five years, World War II came along, and women flew in World War II. Whoa! And let me stop at that point because that's when we get to the wasp. But I did meet my first wasp through this museum called I Wasm, uh, and because of that, thirteen-year-old urge uh, to to know more about this, I started a new career. I I was at that point in my life, just, I had just left the editor's job of my local newspaper. That was my, that was my joy was to have that job. And I had just left it because people kept saying, 
you have a lot more you can give than that. Why are you still working for, for, for the paper? You could be doing more. And I listened to him. And into my lap fell I was him. So let me be quiet a minute and I'll let you ask another question. Oh, you can talk for hours. I just love hearing you talk on this topic. And you mentioned 99. And, you know, I'm not really sure what that is, but I'm sure a lot of other people would love to hear about that. Okay, let, let me launch into that now because it's a fascinating story. Uh, back in, and Amelia Earhart was part of the beginning of the 99s. In, uh, well, the actual date was November 2nd, 1929, when 26 women flyers got together uh, at one of the airports up in, uh, on Long Island and talked about forming a group for women pilots. This, this had actually been, been spawned by the first women's air race, which took place in August of 1929. And 20 women pilots entered that race. Not quite all of them finished. Uh, I've forgotten 17 or 16 or 17 finished. Two or three had uh, mechanical problems along the way and never finished. For Unfortunately, one died. Uh, and, of course, the women were so afraid that was going to make everyone say, oh, those women that can't fly airplanes, they shouldn't be up there. And there was some of that. But... The women who finished, they were they were having conf- little con- conflabs under the stands uh, at, uh, at the airports where they met or where they landed, and they were talking about forming this group. And a couple of the gals really took it from there and invited. They they, they investigated, and at that time, this was fall of 1929, there were 117 licensed women pilots in the United States. They sent a letter to all 117 inviting them to join this group. 26 met that day on Long Island. They sent, they voted to, yes, we're going to have an organization. They sent out letters again and invited everyone again to join. And when it came time to form their, their name, they were arguing, not arguing, they were talking about all sorts of kind of silly lame names like the Lady Birds and all this kind of stuff. And Amelia Earhart finally said, ladies, why don't we just call it after our charter membership? They had 99 charter members. And ever since that day, they have been known as the 99s. I am a proud member. Uh, back on, on November 2nd of 2019, uh, I joined about 75 other of my, my women flyer friends, uh, 99s, uh, in, not, in Long, not on Long Island, but uh, in Oklahoma City at the, the WASP, WASP, excuse me, blah, at the 99s Museum of Women Pilots, which is located at Will Rogers Airport in Oklahoma City. We joined at the museum to celebrate the 99 founders back into the, uh, in uh, 1929. And of course, none of them are still around. So we joined to celebrate on the day that they t- would have been 90 years, 90 years uh, in existence. And that's, that was one of the greatest, greatest moments of my life to be able to be there and, and be part of that. Mm-hmm. And compared to most of these women, I am, uh, I'm just a neophyte pilot, but but a pilot I I, I am, and Good I was a. Like, that's so amazing. That's what the 99s are they? I mean, they've been going. Are, are the membership now. Okay, it started with 99. If I'm not mistaken, our our worldwide membership now, because we are international, is around 6,000 women. It is never. It has never been huge, because the number of women who fly compared to men is still quite small. Uh, but of the women pilots are around the world, there are roughly 6,000 of us that belong to the 99s. And there are two requirements to belong to the 99s. You must be a woman and you must be a licensed pilot. And that can be the lowest license available, which is mine, which is called a sport pilot or a balloon pilot. That, is, that means you are licensed. And those are the two requirements. 
That must have been such an amazing thing to be a part of. How did how did you feel the first time you were part of that group making this flight? Oh boy. Uh, well, uh, this was only the second big meeting I've been. I, I've been in '99 since uh, I actually joined uh, what they they used to call the six, 66s, uh, two thirds of a '99. Or then later we were future woman pilots. I did join that in uh, uh, 2008 when I started to learn to fly. Uh, I actually, by the time I got my license, it was 2011, and that's when I actually joined the 99s proper. Uh, I used to go to their booth up in Oshkosh. Um, Oshkosh Oshkosh is the home of uh, the EAA, uh, Experimental Aircraft Association, uh, 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 air venture, they call it. It is the biggest air show in the world. And I spent, uh, I would spend a lot of time at the 99's booth whenever I would go up there. It's in July of, of the of the year. I've been back in a while now. But that was my first real rubbing of shoulders with them. Plus, I joined the, uh, the all Ohio chapter of the 99's because I lived in Ohio. And the women who had encouraged me and were my good friends were all members of all Ohio. So I used to go to those meetings. And then from there, I started going to um, what we call our sectional meetings. There are, I believe there's five sections across the United States. Uh, I was in uh, North Central then. I now live in the South Central section in in Colorado. Uh, But I went to a couple of those. And finally, last July, uh, I was invited to to speak at our annual big convention, uh, and I was asked to come speak. So I, I did go. I also put my name up for nomination for a uh, museum trustee, uh, the, the Museum of Women Pilots trustee, because I felt like I I had, had the history qu- uh, quota probably that they needed for that. So I was up for, an, uh, up for election and uh, was invited to speak. I took my grandson from here in Colorado Springs with me, age 10, uh, because we were going back to the birthplace of aviation, where I actually lived for many, many, many years. But it was Dayton, Ohio, and we went to the 99s uh, convention, and that was a thrill. That was my first international convention. Oh, my God. It sounds so exciting to be a part of that, especially rekindling this part of history that's so important You know, especially at a time where women didn't really have these kind of roles, it really opened up quite a bit for women. Absolutely. Uh, With the the very few, the number of women who flew, there were a number, but they were a true rarity. Uh, And still, even in World War II, it it still was a rarity. There were 1,102 WASP total. And when you look at the entire Army Air Forces that flew in World War II, the men, 1,102 individuals is very small, a very small uh, percentage uh, of all of the people flying. And that's just flying, let alone uh, the guys on the ground and all that other stuff. Uh, So it was a pretty small part. It, It turned out to be a very significant but very small part. So uh, you've mentioned this a few times, and, but I, I don't want to get too far ahead here. What is a wasp? Okay, uh, it it, uh, uh, it is a it's that excuse me it women's women Air Force service pilots and Air Force is one word, and I have trouble convincing people who think that I, they have to have to be my grammar cor- correct corrector or spelling corrector. It is Air Force one word. And Jackie Cochran, uh, who was the one who coined the name, did it because she was after an acronym that was catchy. Well, WASP is catchy. If it had been, let's see, uh, women, W-A-F-S-P, how do you pronounce that? It's gibberish. So that's Mm -hmm. how the name came about. It is Women Air Force Service Pilots. And they were actually, that was the second name that these women were called by. It's the name they are known for today. Uh, It became the official name. But if you want me to go 
in, into the original history, I, I can start that little piece for you. Oh, I would love if you dived into that because I think it's real important. Okay, okay. Uh, initially, uh, there were there were two women women pilots back uh, in the very early forties uh, who had an idea that women pilots could help out in World War II. Uh, one was Jackie Cochran. The other one is Nancy Love, the woman I wrote about. And she, to me, is the epitome of what they needed from women. She offered the men of the Air Forces exactly what they were asking for in the spring of 1942. And I, I will explain a little for those who, who know very little about World War II. When, when we were attacked in Pearl Harbor on, uh, on December 7th, 1941, our country was not prepared for war. We had been isolationist from Europe all those years on purpose because of World War I. The entire country, we didn't want to get embroiled in that again. However, times had changed. The world was getting smaller uh, because of transportation, like airplanes. And we, we were still living in an era that we did not think the war in Europe was going to affect us. But we were attacked by the Japanese, who had their own imperial ideas uh, out in the Pacific. And, we were, and, and they were allies with Germany, who were the other, uh, the Eastern, uh, excuse me, the, the European uh, contestants. And when we were attacked uh, by Japan, it literally put us at, at a, a two ocean war because we were, uh, we were involved in a war against both of those countries. And of course, it's a world war because it wasn't just the United States. It wasn't just, just Britain and Germany. It was almost, it was the entire European continent and a good bit of Asia. So here we were based, trying to be at peace, trying to be peaceful. And we were, it, we were plunged into a war that we did not have enough men, enough pilots, who were then pretty much all men, uh, munitions, tanks, guns, airplanes. We didn't have it. And the country went into immediate overdrive and started building all these things and recruiting people. By spring of 1942, just a few months into the war, um, our, our factories were building trainer aircraft. Now, trainer aircraft or training aircraft are small airplanes, single engine. Uh, not, uh, they're not meant to do anything more than just like fly around the country here. I mean, they were not armored. Uh, they were built literally out of uh, out of of wood and uh, and fabric for the most part, uh, fabric a uh, cotton of, of some kind. So these were not warplanes, uh, but we needed planes to train more pilots in. We needed to train more male pilots. So we started recruiting the men and we started building trainer aircraft. Well, we took all the men. The, the Air Forces and, and the Navy took all the men who could fly. And when they needed, uh, what, what, excuse me, I'm fumbling over that. When the Army Air Forces uh, Air Transport Command, whose job it was to take airplanes from one place to another, not passengers, not cargo. It was to fly a plane from literally the factory to the training fields. We couldn't find, I say we, uh, Colonel William Tunner, who was in charge of that, could not find enough male pilots by beating the bushes. You know, you know can, can you fly a little? Well, yeah. He couldn't find enough to move all those, those planes, and we were desperate to move them. And that's when Nancy Love went to... Uh, well, she got an audience with, with Colonel Tunner because she knew a number of people. She and her husband were pretty high up in, in military, uh, not excuse me, not military, in aviation, civilian aviation. And she was known. And she, she got an audience with uh, Colonel Tunner. And she told him, yes, she could find him uh, ferry pilots. 
that she knew of oh, but between 80 and 100 women pilots who could meet that bill, who had the requirements, who had pilot's licenses, a 200 horsepower rating, uh, which is pretty, pretty good. And he bought into it. He didn't go around asking any any other people. He didn't run this by Hap Arnold. He got his job done. And his immediate boss, uh, Colonel, jo- uh, excuse me, General George, did appro- approved of this. These were two guys who who had had the willingness to see a vision. In fact, they had a vision of their own, and that was that was to be able to take airplanes. Their job was to get airplanes around the world, not just the United States. They were responsible for getting air, aircraft back and forth across oceans, which we didn't really do that uh, back in the early 40s. So they built that, and alongside, they built a, a group of uh, ferry pilots who could take these small planes from the factory, uh, which mostly were out west or up north, to the training fields, which mostly were in Texas. And that was the job that Nancy said she she could find him pilots. He said, do it. And she got, uh, with including herself, 28 women pilots, experienced women pilots, who could fly those aircraft. They didn't need literally further training. What they did give them was an orientation into Army flying and Army procedures, uh, which they did not know because it was strictly with the army. Uh, so they were given a, a 30 day orientation into flying army aircraft. And with that, the 28 women took off ferrying these little trainers and that's what they were hired to do. And that's really all they, all they expected to do, except that every one of them was adventurous enough to think, Hey, I can fly this. I bet you I can fly something bigger or faster or more complex. And as as the war went along and changed, as needs changed, they did. The women did move into the other aircraft. And, of course, that's that's the second part of the story. Uh, What I've given you is the beginning of how how women began flying for the Army Air Forces and what they were doing. And that they actually started in September of 1942. And that was Nancy's, that was Nancy's doing. That's Nancy's. Wow. That is just amazing. And, you know, because there was such a bias at that time. So for this to go forward, I mean, it really took a, I mean, it really took a lot for that, you know, that general to just go, you know, let this, we're going to do this, you know? Right. Well, as I said, one thing, and here's where personality Personality and and ability uh, and known ability comes in. Uh, Nancy was a very she was not a pushy woman, but she knew of what she spoke. She was uh, very well well skilled in aviation. She knew her way around. She had actually been working since the war started. She had been working with the ferrying division, which is part of the Air Transport Command. Uh, finding help, helping her uh, her commander, who happened at that point was uh, 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 Major Bob Baker. Uh, she had been helping Baker to find uh, uh, find pilots to fly his airplanes to to do routes. They ha- they had to establish these routes across the country, uh, but even more so across the oceans. We didn't have them. This was all new. World War Two caused the invention of a whole lot of things we didn't have before. And one was flying globally. So Nancy was just working in the office, helping him as civilian help. And that's where she got part of her reputation um, in being able to, to do these things. She, she was a smart gal and her husband by then had been, uh, he, he had been in the reserve. He was now part of the air transport command and, uh, he was working under Colonel Tunner at that point and mentioned one day to Colonel Tunner that uh, his wife uh, was flying, flying to work. Well, what she was doing, uh, Bob and Nancy were living in Washington, D.C., because that's where he was assigned. 
And she was working for Major Baker up in uh, Baltimore. And you couldn't get gas for your car. You, uh, the gas was uh, rationed by then, but you could get it for an airplane. And they owned an airplane. So Nancy flew to work every day from D.C. to Baltimore, which is, what, 30 miles or something like that, or 40. But she couldn't do it in the car, so she was flying. And Colonel Tunner said, your wife flies? And Bob said, yes. What I, I'm quoting to you what I read in Colonel Tunner's book, General Tunner's book. This is what he said happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's right in his book. Your wife flies? Are there more women like her? And Bob's, uh, Bob said, you need to talk to Nancy. And that's how it all started. Okay, so I totally love how her husband handled that. Instead of answering for her, it's like, yep. you need to talk to Nancy. It was a rarity. I mean, I ne- listen, I never knew either one of them. I do know their daughters. Uh, and yeah, yeah, uh, he was he was a good guy. So where did you get to the point where this became, obviously it's a huge passion for you. You can, you can hear it in your voice. Right. You know, when did writing about women pilots become something that you're like, gosh, I need to start doing this? Okay. Uh, I told you that I, I, had, I had left, the, uh, being, I was the editor of the local newspaper, which was my dream at that point. And I had done the job, but I was getting restless. <clears throat> uh, actually, my, my two kids had graduated from college by then, and I felt like, okay, I can branch out on my own. <clears throat> and I met the, the ladies at this IWASM. Through, through the women at IWASM, International Women's Air and Space Museum, I met my first WASP. Her name was Nadine Nagel. And I totally fell in love with her story. And I, I said, I wanted to write her biography. And, and she was she was so uh, modest and all. No, she didn't, didn't want that. But she started taking me to WASP reunions and getting me acquainted uh, with some of the others. And she and I... And the, uh, the, the woman who, uh, excuse me, the uh, director of the museum, Joan Rubeck, uh, a pilot, uh, we started a, a, a group of programs on our local cable network, not, not national, just our uh, uh, public com- community, community television. And they were crying for stuff. So we, uh, th- they had been bringing in speakers and, I went and listened to one of the speakers uh, and they weren't recording it or anything. We're talking about women who had background. This is back in the eighties, excuse me, the Um, uh, nineties. Women who had background in, uh, in aviation and they were bringing them in to small to, to speak to this small group, but nothing was being recorded. And I said, Joan, that's history. And that's what you're about. So, uh, because I'd been at the newspaper, I had a lot of contacts, and I took her over and introduced, introduced her to um, our public radio people. And we set up uh, doing three programs a year, uh, three like a lecture series, and uh, we, we did uh, November, January, and March, and nineteen fifty ninety. One, I think, was the first one. Anyway, um, we got the first one going. And by then, I had been hearing all the stuff about the WASP. And so I said, why don't we we get a WASP panel? Well, we had some who lived close or, you know, in the state of Ohio. One lived in in Indiana who was real close. Uh, But I had heard about this woman named Nancy Batson Cruz. And Nancy was one of Nancy Love's original WAFs. And I had heard, <clears throat> heard a lot about her. And she seemed to be a real upfront, neat to listen to, um, kind of active, activist kind of lady. So I contacted her and asked her if she could come up to Dayton, Ohio, uh, for uh, 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 this weekend so that we could do this program. They were Monday night, and then rec- we recorded them at the uh, Cable cable Council studio. And she said, yeah. So Nancy drove up from Birmingham, 
Oh, excuse me. No, take that back. She did not drive up. She flew. Uh, it was it was January. <laughs> she flew. And Nadine and I went out to the, to the air, airport to pick her up. Nancy and I hit it off. And over the next few years, we talked a lot. I wanted to do her story. And finally, when I kept pushing and pushing, she said, no, Sarah. She was from Alabama. No, Sarah. I want you to write about Nancy Love and the WAFs. And I said, how? You know, I, I live in Centerville, Ohio, which is what it says it is. It's this little town in the middle of the country. And these women are scattered all over. And they're not going to want to listen to me. I, said, I have no name. You know, no one's ever heard of me outside of Centerville. How am I going to do this? And she said, well, that's no problem. I will have a reunion. Well, there were nine of them still alive then. She was able, six of them came to Birmingham that summer. And this was June of 1999. And six of them, she had them come to Birmingham. She set up a reunion. She did it for me so that I could interview them, get to know them, and get their stories and write this book. Now, it was opened up to some other people who were also interested in the same thing. I mean, because I'm not the only one. But she, she did it for me. And with that, I was off on, on my, the rest of my career. I had just finished my master's degree in creative writing. I had wanted to, be, to write the great American novel since I was five years old. I've never written the great American novel. I stopped writing fiction and went over to writing nonfiction, which for a journalist is really not a stretch. Uh, I had to learn how to be a historian, and that's taken several years. But uh, I went over to writing nonfiction and working with Nancy. And this was in the year ni- <clears throat> 1999 and, and two, 2000. Uh, I wrote the originals, the Women's Auxiliary Ferrying Squadron of World War II, which is one heck of a long title. Uh, but it's it's the WAFs, the women, and I didn't even tell you that. I told you about, you know, the predecessor, or excuse me, the successor to the WASP. Mm-hmm. They were the Women's Auxiliary Ferrying Squadron, WAFs. And this book was about the 28 WAFs, the 28 original WAFs. And that's how many there were. Nancy Love was number one. And the 27 that she recruited. And that is what that first book was about. It was the only book of its kind. Because anyone else writing about the Wasp had picked up on the Jackie Cochran story, which is the second half of the story, but a far bigger part of the story. Because Jackie recruited uh, 1,074 women to go through flight school and learn how to fly. That's the other half of the story. And they, they then beefed out uh, what was started by these 28. So that we went from 28 originals to eventually 1,102 women who wore wasp wings. And it, it was the work of two of them. But everybody else wrote about Cochran and what she did. Nobody paid any attention to Nancy and her girls. I changed that. And I did it because Nancy... Cruz asked me to do it and made it possible, worked with me on the book. And here's the tragic part. While I was work, while we were working on it, she was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer. She died before the book came out. She did read the manuscript. She was thrilled, but she died six months before the book was actually published. So it, I did it for her. It's dedicated to her. Um, and without, if it had not been for her, you would not be talking to me today because what I would have done would have been nothing like I consider what, what this has been to tell, tell this story. And she's the reason, she's the reason I'm doing this. Wow. What a story. That's just so remarkable. The path that we take in yes. getting to what makes us so passionate in life, you know, and it seems like you have been at the right place at the right time Absolutely. And collected these great stories. Right. I knew, a t- I knew a ton of the gals because when I started this, oh, 
geez, there were still 700, 800 of them alive. Uh, uh, yeah, by the time I started a medium, we had lost a number. But yeah, most of them were still around. And uh, the, young, the, the youngest were ugh, in their 70s then. Uh, and uh, now the, the, the survivors, and as of today, since I haven't heard any, from anybody else today, there are 34 left and the youngest is 96. So that gives you an idea uh, of what it was. So I, I got literally got to meet a ton of my, uh, I met, uh, as I said, um, I actually met eight of the nine originals. Uh, one I ended up talking to on the phone. Uh, uh, I, I literally shook hands and, and met uh, eight of them, but I've met a ton of the gals who came up through the flight school um, and, and flew and flew everything uh, because as they came in and improved and, and it's always true. The, the, the really good, the talented rise to the top and the really good women pilots in that group rose to the top and they were the ones who ferried the big plates. And of course, Nancy, Nancy Batson was one of them. Uh, she, uh, she flew almost everything. Uh, she was up to the twin engine uh, P38 of which only 26 women qualified on that plane, which I've gotten out of, out of your realm right now. We, we just jumped. So I'll go back. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's okay. Because I mean, there's so much to learn here. It gets so exciting when we talk about this, my goodness, you know, I I'm curious, have any of, um, the WASP pilots, have they had any of their children that have taken up flying too? Yep. Yep. Uh, some of them have. Uh, okay. B.J. Erickson, London. Uh, and B.J. is the first book in my uh, my WASP, uh, WASP pilot series for young adults. Uh, B.J. was one of the originals. Uh, and B.J. had two daughters. Both learned to fly. Uh, one became an airline pilot. Terry uh Terry London uh became one of the earliest women airline pilots back in the 70s. She was not the first, but uh roughly within the first 10. She went to work for oh dear. Um I'm blank on on who she was. Okay. Doesn't matter. Doesn't yeah. matter. Uh, it, Terry, it, Terry London, uh, then uh, she married a, a, a pilot. Her, her name is Terry London Reinhardt. And uh, as I say, she is now a retired Delta Airlines captain. Uh, married a guy who worked for United. So, uh, you know, there were two of them. They have three children. Uh, their son is an airline pilot. They have twin daughters. Both are pilots. One is flying corporate jets. The other one just is flying, but she has all her ratings. And when I was out there to visit them a few years ago, she, her dad was taking her up, getting her, you know, like advanced degrees and everything. So uh, uh, she, Lauren flies, uh, but uh, uh, then I just go on blank. Uh, her sister, I'll, come, I'll remember, you know, hell to forget things. I'll remember in a minute. Uh, her sister is flying corporate, uh, corporate airplanes. And her, she flew, um, I'm going to get into something else. If I go, if I go into that, l- let me back off for, for a minute. Uh, let me just leave. Uh, Kelly, Kelly, Re- uh, Kelly Reinhardt Lieber is her mm-hmm. name. Uh, so, okay. That's one where three generations of pilots. Uh, Nancy cruises, uh, Nancy Batson cruises, uh, uh, younger son, uh, became an airline pilot. The other two are not interested. Uh, many of them have grandchildren who are now, now flying for the airlines, but you know, not, not everybody, um, you'd end up, uh, some of them said, yeah, my kids had air sickness and couldn't do it. Uh, oh, Nancy loves kids. Um, uh, uh one got her license and the other one got up to it, but just never did. Uh, so yes, they did. They did influence their kids to fly. Yes. Well, it's so interesting because everyone has different likes and dislikes. So, you know, you get up there and maybe decide, oh, I don't kind of like this, you know, as much as I do, or maybe you love it. Who knows, you know? Exactly. Exactly. Mm-mm-mm. 
You don't know until you try. Well, and, you know, I know we kind of talked about this a little bit in the beginning of our discussion. What do you want young readers to take away from these books? Okay. The big, the big thing is, and, and the, the reason I started writing for young adults is that about three years ago, when I had just finished doing all of my, my work on, the, on B.J. Erickson's story, uh, uh, I had talked to her. I got to know her real well, and I had done all of my, my talking with her on oral history. But I had worked with Terry uh, and, uh, and Kelly in getting more on their mom, so I had a bigger picture. So I had finished the research and was ready to write the book. And two of my friends, two of my, my author friends, who are uh, retired teachers, uh, said, why aren't you writing these stories for the young girls? You're writing all this stuff is aimed at, at you know, old people. Uh, and it's the young girls who need to hear these stories. Well, I knew they were right. Uh, I just had never thought I could do it. So I, I didn't try to uh, try to write for them. And I sur- I knew I couldn't write for ki- little kids. You know, I knew I couldn't do those uh, too much. The journalist. So uh, I I had to think about it. Finally, I thought, you know, they, sh- these gals said, these young women need to know that women have succeeded in the past. And they said, the stories that you tell about these gals and yes, uh, the girls today, these are, would be their great grandmothers. Oh, that's that's how far far along we are. But I know it's a different world than you and I grew up in, uh, than than my kids grew up in. It's a totally different world, and there is an emphasis now on girls to do stuff. But not every girl has the guts to to come on and do some of these things. And what they were telling me is these gals showed what what it took to do this back when women really didn't do that, other than a few who had who had, had learned how learned how to fly and would fly in the 30s. This was not something women did, and they had to go against the grain, which continued years, as you well know, after that and continues today. So you got these girls who are influenced by all of this stuff today. Uh who can get lost very easily. And what's the book, um, Finding Ophelia, or something like that? Um, and I, mm-hmm. I forget, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, it, it's that, that was, well, I hadn't thought about it. I, I raised two boys, but I have two granddaughters now. So uh, I started thinking, and I, okay, if, if I can do this. Well, if you're a writer, you're a writer. And it's just a matter of, altering, altering a little bit what you do. As a journalist, I learned to write short sentences and short paragraphs. It was a necessity, at least the paragraphs. And that was not hard for me to do. But I still, in in spite of knowing that, I still would, I would write several compound sentences. And because when you're writing for adults, you can know you can do that. So I've had to learn to take those long sentences and make two, maybe even three out of it, not choppy. That's one thing I have a good sense of uh, is pace. And I know if I, if I'm getting out, out of the box on, on pace in writing. So it has been a two and a half year journey for me in learning to write for young adults. Um, I, I went out and I found a new publisher because I am pretty much published by university presses. Uh, and these were, were uh, uh, sourced books, uh, uh, intellectual books. Uh, um, and that's, that's who buys those kind of books. Uh, and I realized that writing for kids, uh, I, yeah, I was not going to be footnoting stuff. So uh, I, I began retooling how I did this and trying to tell things in a little simpler, not, not easy language, not, uh, not elementary language, but just without quite so many big words instead of going for the big word. And that's, that's true of any writing. You're really better off to stay with the good concrete word, forget trying to impress people. So I, I would learn to look for other synonyms and to make it easier. And the one thing that I, I will do 
is aviation terms, adults do not know them either. So I have started giving a very small uh, uh, identification of what uh, reasonable, uh, excuse me, uh, what they are, and just in a in in, in a, a parentheses parentheses right after. I don't mean long ones, but I'm just giving three or four words to try to explain what hydraulics is. You know, okay, it's a movement of water. Uh, I didn't know that until I. You know, I, I finally, well, I didn't know it when I was a kid. Didn't, it didn't matter. So I try to write. I will not, will not write down to kids. That's why I don't write for children because I can't do that. But I figure any bright 10-year-old, uh, I remember me at 10. I could read anything. And my mother, thank her for it. If I could read it and wanted to, she let me read it. And it's one of the best educations I ever had. Uh, I learned to read adult books. And, you know, dang it, if you don't understand the word, you just go to the dictionary and look it up. And I think, you know, if, if kids are going if, if to, if they're going to complain about, oh, I don't understand what that word is. You know, it's real easy. It's real easy. You go to the dictionary. But I try and help them out. I put glossaries in these books for a lot of the aviation, not not the not the terms that are in the sentences, but I explain what each of these airplanes are. Uh, I give I give details, but that's in the glossary. So I'm getting better at it. My editor uh, has to keep keep you know checking me checking me out. She'll ask me to you know you know let's let's just change this a little bit. So I'm learning from her. But she I went to her because uh, I'd known her for years. And I know she does publish some other young adult books so and some children. So she had some background in it that I did not. And I also did not want a university press. Uh, and I didn't want, uh, you're going to laugh when I say I didn't want a New York press. God forbid that I would ever be lucky enough to get one. But not for the, <laughs> I mean, you know, so I, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not bragging here. What I'm saying is uh, I wanted I wanted to be part of the whole process, part of the control. I have been, I've been doing newsletters. Uh, uh, after I left the newspaper business, uh, I started doing newsletters for nonprofits. Uh, I know what it, what it is to be an editor. I am one. Um, I, I put publications together. I ha- have too much knowledge of the actual, I'm not just a writer. Uh, I've learned all this other stuff. And I actually give credit to, uh, the first big newspaper I worked for where they started, they started teaching me how, how to do some of this other stuff because somehow they must have seen in me the possibility of someone who was going to not just be a reporter all her life that I had the making. I'm guessing this, I'm guessing this because uh, a couple of people worked with me quite well on that. And I got, I got acquainted with it. So when I got called on uh, to edit my first newspaper, I did two. Uh, one was just a small, small little publication, but I knew what I was doing and therefore I could do it. Okay. You take the working for two different newspapers as an editor for a while, and then you move on to writing books. You want to be more than just the writer who hands it over and says, okay, it's yours now. I have trouble doing that. And when I got into this kind of writing, and particularly I know the subject better than anybody who's editing me, I want I want an integral part of what is, what happens. So I needed a publisher small enough, uh, and who knew me well enough to work with me. And Doris is marvelous. Uh, we are a perfect fit, and she's one hell of an editor too. Uh, which it makes has- such a big difference when you have somebody that knows you and knows your work. That can really support you on your journey. It seems like you've had people along your path that have done that. I have. I've been really, really, really fortunate with that. Yes. Mm -hmm. My goodness, Sarah. I mean, we could talk all day. Where (laughs) can our listeners connect with you and learn more about your books? Not just Nancy Love, Wasp Pilot, but all of the books that you have and be part of your community. Okay. Uh, I have a website. Uh, it is uh, sarahburnrickman.com, and it's all lowercase, and it's all strung together, and Sarah's with an H. Uh, 
and it's burn B Y R N, which everybody spells wrong. Um, but anyway, Sarah burn Rickman.com. Uh, go on my website. All of my books are listed there. I have given a, a brief overview of how, of the wasp, how they started. Uh, I've got some other stuff on there and I have started writing a blog. I started last March and I've been I, for a while. I did it every week. And then I fell off for a little while. Uh, that I was like every three weeks. I'm trying to get back to the, at, at least uh, every other week. Now my blogs are about the wasp, about my journey with them, about my journey with aviation once I don't know that I've ever written anything that didn't have something to do with with wasp uh, the ninety nines. In other words, aviation of some kind. I, I really have stuck to that. Uh, they're very good, I, and I can brag on that. Uh, you know, somebody who's had had all those years of journalism uh, and uh, and writing books can usually write a a pretty informative piece, and I think they are. So if you get Come to my website and click on blog. Uh, you know what I don't have, and I got to I got to talk to Mary, my marketing agent. Uh, we need to get a sign up. I don't have that. I just ask people to tell you know give me their emails if they would like to get it. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, and then not only do I have have the blog on the uh, the website, but uh, my marketing agent is now taking about every three weeks. She will will combine two or three of those blogs together and send them out as a newsletter. And I need to figure out, uh, I need to do due diligence and to fix it where people can sign up for that. I don't think they can yet. I'm just, this is pretty much new to me. Uh, all this, this kind of stuff that I've been, I never had to do this before because I, I had university presses that were doing the publicity and I just did what they told me. Yeah. Now I'm working, you know, uh, I'm doing it myself with the help uh, of a good marketing person and with a good publisher editor. Well, do you know, Sarah, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Well, thank you. This is marvelous. I had a good time. <laughs> Well, thank you, Sarah. It's been such an honor to spend this time with you. And of course, to talk about your new book, Nancy Love, Wasp Pilot. Nancy Love, Wasp Pilot is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and select indie retailers. And if they don't have it on the shelf, ask for them to order it. Again, if you like to connect with Sarah, you can at sarahburnrickman.com for more information. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Mary Ann is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work, and while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just what moment will change your life forever. Moments with Marianne airs every Friday and Saturday at 5 p.m. Pacific and 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Make sure to tune in and visit MomentsWithMarianne.com for more information.